Hi, everyone. This is Maheen, and welcome to the Canadian SME Small Business Podcast, where today we're joined by a pioneering entrepreneur transforming wine management with cutting-edge tech. Josh Dater, the co-founder and CEO of Inventory, is a revolutionizing wine collection management for individuals and businesses. With dual master's degrees in entrepreneurship and AI, he's led Inventory to reach over $1 million in revenue, blending tech and strategy for a unique industry impact. Josh, we're very thrilled to have you on the podcast. How are you? Thank you so much. That was a great intro. I'm thrilled to be here. No, we're very excited uh, to have your insights and expertise shared with our audience here. Uh, but before we do, uh, Josh, you know, starting a business, especially in a niche like wine tech, you know, it takes courage. It takes a lot of vision. So let's kick things off by talking about your entrepreneurial beginnings. How did you get started with inventory and what were some of the first steps you took to build the company? Yeah, it's uh, quite a loaded question, um, but I think everything usually just starts for most people, including myself, as a pet project. So, you know, um, at that time when I started, it was about four years ago, uh, me and my dad had teamed up together and we just had the intent of, you know, building something that was better than what he was already using for wine management. And uh, at that time, he had retired. Uh, he had sold uh, a medical practice and he just wanted to drink wine and uh, write screenplays. And he was looking all over for, for inventory management solutions for his collection. He stumbled upon some of our biggest competitors. And after using them, he eventually fell back to using Excel. And mm -hmm. uh, when you have to go back to using Excel for anything, you know that there's an opportunity here. So it pretty much began as like, hey, I'll just help you. I graduated from school. I was learning how to build apps. And it was kind of my first foray into taking on a project uh, by myself. And uh, yeah, we I, I couldn't have done it alone, but um, it was definitely that initial interest of trying to learn something new that really sparked uh, the initial beginnings of the business. Now, it's really inspiring to hear about the journey and the early challenges that shaped Inventory's foundation. And listeners, every entrepreneurial journey starts with a brave first step. So if you are inspired, remember to tr trust your vision and please keep pushing forward. Uh, moving on, Josh, let's explore the crucial topic of fundraising and what it takes to secure financial backing because fundraising is, a, is an essential part of scaling any business and your experience firsthand. So we'd love your insights on this. Uh, Josh, what strategies have you you found effective for fundraising and what challenges did you encounter along the way? Yeah, this is a great question and something I'm pretty passionate about because we took quite an unconventional route. But I think that the reason that we did this is because we faced a lot of the challenges that many people face today. And that's that it's extremely hard to get institutional money. And what we ended up actually doing is raising from our user base. And I think that uh, it was a genius idea that my dad came up with at the time because we were really struggling to raise money from uh, sorry, institutional investors. Um, and it was right at the time after COVID when the markets kind of turned down and no one was investing in anything. And we just realized we had this, you know, really passionate user base who fortunately for us just so happened to have money because they were collecting wine. And uh, we just sent out an email and said, hey, um, we're doing our first uh, round. It's a pre-seed round. Um, does anyone want to participate? And we got a ton of emails back. We got $10 million worth of pledged capital. Obviously, not all of that converts into an actual investment, but that fueled our first fundraising round a couple of years ago. And for this round, we actually adopted the same strategy. Um, one thing that we actually learned through the process of going to institutional investors is a lot of them would tell you how to operate your business. And what ends up happening is you can end up in this trap of changing your business around to fit their framework. And I think that that's a really slippery slope because you end up building a business that might not be feasible in practice, but just looks good on the surface. And I think we went down that path and had to unravel all of that back to what are the basics of the problem we're trying to solve? What's our vision? And we got the investors to rally around us to achieve what we want to achieve. No, those are fantastic insights, Josh. It's quite clear that determination and resilience are key to attracting investors. Now, for founders facing rejection from investors, what advice would you offer? Yeah, it's it's similar to to what I just mentioned in terms of like not you know changing your business to conform to whatever their feedback is. I think that the rejection when it comes to pitching to investors is normal. You're going to pitch to you know hundreds of people. 
before you get that person who really believes in your vision. And you kind of should be using every rejection as a way to not change the business model to fit into their framework, but change how you're pitching. Like we started off with a pitch deck sitting down for a 20 minute meeting and that was so boring. And the final uh, result that we ended up with was no pitch deck, just a, a call. It was mainly just conversations. And I think that when you engage people in conversation, that's when they feel like they have the opportunity to give you ideas. And then it's kind of like a positive feedback loop effect where they feel bought into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Those are some great insights, Josh. I mean, fundraising is indeed a unique challenge for every entrepreneur. And listeners, navigating doubt and rejection is part of the journey. You know, keep your vision clear and remember that per persistence really or sometimes often open new doors. Um, Josh, now let's shift gears and uh, discuss product development and creating something that truly resonates with users because building a product that speaks to these users is essential for the long-term success and you've achieved that with inventory um what, what are some key lessons that you've learned in the product development stage and you know especially in building something that resonates with users yeah it's it there's there's warning signs on i think one end of the spectrum here when it comes to product development and then on the other so i would say you know on this side of things at the very beginning, it's really important to just build what you think is right and build the first version of the problem that you see. So a lot of that is trusting your gut, doing research, and then just putting something out there. As that matures and you get feedback from people, it's really important that you don't do that too late in the journey. So listening to, for example, like listening to one user or listening to two users about one particular feature, because what ends up happening later down the road is you end up with potential feature bloat where you listen to every single user and what they want and then you end up with 300 different versions of your product and that's mm -hmm. insanely hard to maintain so uh beginning stages definitely listen to your gut what you think is right do the research and then when you grow the business and your product becomes more mature and refined from there definitely uh making decisions based on data so if someone has feedback for you you can do little tests without building the whole thing to see, is that something that people will want? What's the outcome we're looking for with this test? And then that's how you can drive a lot of your product decisions. And I think they're, it's, it's really difficult because they're two completely different frameworks of thinking. And it's hard to go from, you know, the early stage framework to the mid stage framework. And uh, it's just something to be aware of when you build product. Oh, your approach to user feedback really emphasizes how listening to your audience drives innovation. But how do you maintain a cycle of improvement based on user insights, Josh? Yeah, a lot of this is is just data. So recently, we actually um, feature flagged, which is like where you A-B test, you know, one version of, of the app and another version, but like very small. So we might put a button here. And then in this version, the button's not there. And we would measure, okay, what's the outcome we want uh, with this test? And for us, the outcome was we wanted more people to add bottles to their collection and we wanted more people to convert to the paid tier. And so we measured those two things across both of those um, experiments and then we ran them. And then we found that one performed better than the other. And it's okay if those experiments fail because that just means that the assumption that you're testing wasn't correct. And that's okay. I mean, you you don't know what you don't know. So you really have to test these things. But also it's important to know what to test. So it always starts with a gut feeling or some feedback, like this doesn't work, or I think this could be better. Um, and then from there, you build the tests out, you gather the data. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tough balance because you don't want to A-B test every little thing because you'll move too slowly, but just the the key little optimizations that you need. Well, thank you for those insights, Josh. Creating a user-focused product is, is truly invaluable. Now let's look at a powerful tool uh, in inventory success story, which is AI. I mean, AI is transforming industries across the board, including mind management. So let's talk about how AI has been a game changer for inventory. Uh, Josh, how has AI been integral to inventory's growth and what specific tools or approaches have proven most effective? Yeah, there's really two different ends of the spectrum here in terms of AI. And and when I say AI, I mostly mean using LLMs. I don't mean building proprietary models in-house because I think that that's, that's a huge lift for us. But just leveraging what's out there like GPT and, and Claude and all of that stuff. I mean, the first way is that we actually wanted to do something that was a little fun. And we built uh, 
a GPT enabled chat bot called Vincent to help people get recommendations based on wines in their collection. And I think that this really takes the guesswork out mm -hmm. of what a wine collector or a wine enthusiast would want, because instead of putting in all these filters for what they want to find in their collection, they can just speak it as if they're talking to a sommelier. So that was the first way, which I think is pretty cool. And the second is a little more under the hood. So we actually use a lot of these um, LLMs and tools to help us clean up data, match data, um, and really do this efficiently so that we don't have to use a, a ton of human intervention and, you know, people going through data points and matching them together. We use as much AI as possible so that we can massage all of this data and quickly pipe it in so that we, we can have the most robust database in the world. And it's really fascinating to see how you're leveraging AI to modernize an industry that is steeped in tradition. Mm -hmm. um, this is to technology is transforming every industry, mm -hmm. big or small. And if you embrace it wisely, you must you might just find the key to scaling your business. Uh, finally, Josh just discuss how you founded and secured product market fit, especially in the niche wine industry, because product market fit is essential for any startup to thrive, especially in specialized markets. Uh, Josh, what strategies have helped you secure product market fit in the niche market like wine? Yeah, this is the most challenging thing, because I think with something like product market fit, you always want to believe you have it when you really don't. And I think that what constitutes product market fit is when people start coming to you and start telling you where you need to be. Um, so for example, for us, well, to answer the question, a lot of it was persistence and listening to our customers. So really understanding, deeply understanding what the problem at hand is, because if you don't solve the user's problem, then they won't basically have any money or, or want, they won't be willing to pay you to solve that problem. So it's really understanding what that pain point is and why people are, are buying your product and how to scale that up. The second signal I think is when other types of markets are opening up to you. So for us, we started in the private sector, you know, just serving private wine collectors. And what we started to see was a ton of inbound restaurants, hotels, golf and country clubs reaching out to us, asking for a product uh, very similar to what we have in their sector. So I think mm -hmm. that for us, that was really big positive signal for us because we didn't have to reach out to them to convince them to use our product. They were finding us and saying, hey, that really solves our problem. And I think when that starts to happen is when you start to really have that aha moment of product market fit. Oh, that's fantastic, Josh. I mean, your approach itself is great to securing a place in the market, which is both practical and insightful. Uh, but thank you for sharing such valuable guidance, your insights in finding the right market fit. You know, it offers practical advice for other entrepreneurs that are on the same path. But as we conclude now, uh, Josh, what final piece of advice would you offer to aspiring tech entrepreneurs that are just beginning their journeys? Any key takeaways from your experience would be very helpful. Yeah, this one's a little bit more depressing, but just stick with it. Um, it's not a glamorous process. It can definitely be fun, but there are a lot of things that are not fun about building a business. And those are the things I think that matter. And it's learning to find the joy in those things that are not fun. Um, that is going to really take you to the next level. So kind of, it's kind of like working out where you like love the pain of lifting weights or something like that. It's very similar uh, with building a business. Thank you so much, Josh, for joining us and for sharing your insights. It's been a pleasure to having you on the podcast. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Loved it. And today's episode with Josh Dater ends to ends right now. I mean, he's, he's, he's been a great speaker. He's co-founded and being the CEO of Inventory has been a fascinating look. We've had a fascinating look into blending tradition and tech. We discussed how he started Inventory, the role of AI, and strategies for finding product market fit. We'd like to extend our gratitude to our partners as well, RBC, UPS, Constant Contact, IAG, and Google, whose invaluable support makes these conversations possible. To our listeners, please don't forget to visit the website canadiansme.ca and subscribe to the magazine for more insightful content. Again, we look forward to connecting with you in our next episode.